Hey everybody, Coach here. Hey, thanks for taking a couple minutes. I do appreciate it. I think you're going to learn quite a bit here on this particular episode. And please, if you haven't already, check out the YouTube channel. And also it's over on Reddit and Instagram and everything else that Maestro has spread it across the social media platforms of this globe. But hey, this week, this week we're talking about hillside plantings. We're talking about stability and erosion mitigation and that kind of stuff. You know, no doubt that hardscape features like retaining walls and boulder walls and cement walls and wood walls and terracing and all that kind of stuff can mitigate and even eliminate any hillside erosion. But, but, not everybody can afford that stuff. And I'm speaking to you if it applies. But proper application and selection of plant material can also, just like Mother Nature does, slow it and eliminate it as well. This is what we talk about this week here on Yard Coach. I am glad you are with me, so let's do this thing. Hey friends, Maestro here. Just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. Hey, if you haven't already and you do get something from this, before you leave today, would you mind giving me a, a subscribe and a like? Recommend it to a friend that might need some um, landscape information, and I would greatly appreciate that. Hey, I have covered in a few episodes about hardscape hillside stabilization, like the top of the show suggested. You know, walls and terracing and that kind of stuff. Using boulders and all the materials that it takes to stabilize a hillside. However, there are some of you out there that don't want to get off into the man-made wall stuff. You want to have an au natural hillside, and so what do we do? Especially if we're on a budget. You know, you can use plant material in various forms and certain selections if you desire to leave the hillside at its natural slope and a much more natural look than man-made interference with man-made materials. You know, think about it. I mean, Mother Nature does it all over the freaking globe where applicable. She really does. She has a way of selecting the perfect amount of ground cover, trees, shrubbery, ferns, and anything else that she can find to hold the hills and mountains in place well over 90 to 95% of the time. Of course, Ma Nature's twin sister sometimes comes in and dumps mega water and just overwhelms everything. And that's where you get landslides and hill slides and mudslides. But you know something in modern day, and I'm going to speak to a lot of the western U.S. right now. Man, a lot of that destabilization comes from wildfire. And in some cases, major developments, residential developments. And then you get lots and lots of rain like this past year. And that can really destabilize those brand new homes, landscapes. And suddenly you have a lot of erosion, a lot of washing, and a big fat freaking mess. In a residential application, usually in the suburbs and sometimes in rural locations, homeowners have to do something in order to make their landscape and dwelling safe and not under threat when you close your eyes and the heavens are opening up and you know you got a bare damn hillside back there that's just going to wash to your little back patio. Oftentimes this may be evident in new home builds more than established neighborhoods, but not always. And slopes and backyards are bare and have a fairly, I've seen some steep slopes, both online, researching this, and in my professional exposure too. Uh, the, the hillsides up in the, the foothills in Northern California, there were times where developers had to scrape the hill and cut into the hillside in order to put a house on. And then it sat there naked and washed out the next winter. Now, for homeowners, having taken possession of your new abode, it is incumbent on that owner to throw efforts at the hillside so erosion and landslide events are mitigated and slowed down. Maybe not eliminated unless you go the full 10 yards we're talking about here today, but you need to do it and you need to do it fairly fast, especially if you're in an area that is subjected to rather regular rainfall, shall we say. Now out west, Ah, uh, good. I can never predict Ma Nature anyway. But in the Pacific Northwest, 
and certainly during like monsoon seasons in the southwest and in some cases during winter time you know you you got to get on it it's not something that you move the boxes in and then just totally ignore it for a year because that upcoming winter events may be your downfall you know if that hillside that you may or may not have maybe you know somebody who does have if the soils are conducive to amending and planting plant material man you should do it and you should do it with a little bit of thought i am not speaking about like hydro seeding the hill and hoping for just wild land grasses and that kind of stuff to do the job they can but there is a more comprehensive approach which is what we're getting into right now let's take a look just a little deeper and a little more thorough into this topic first like all other landscape endeavors and what I preach over and over on this channel, it will require a lot of thought, research, planning, design, and certainly execution. Approaching this in a cavalier fashion will result in a haphazard attempts and results, which might work, but in most cases have some, if not total failure as a result of it, and a loss of the dollars you threw at it. And I actually mean you threw at it and it didn't stick very well. Let's look at some of the steps, shall we? Let's look at the steps to apply to conquering such an odd landscape situation. Most of our landscape situations involve, you know, maybe a little bit of slope here and there, but a lot of it is flat ground. In this case, we're talking slopes. And I've seen slopes 30 degrees in pitch with an average of probably about 15 to 20. That's what I call a steep hillside. One of the first things you need to understand is your location and what thrives in your area and would be used in such hillside situations. I will make a few suggestions, but it will be important for you to make the recon runs to the nursery. Search online for plant selections and consult with your local nursery pro that can point out to you the right plants that could work for you in your area you know at the end of this at the end of this podcast i'm going to have quite a few selections that you can search out and you can amend those a little bit but i'm doing it based on my own experience i'm not in northern minnesota i'm not in alaska i'm not in the eastern seaboard i practice mostly on the west coast of northern california i haven't planted in the red mud of georgia the red clay muds I, I don't have any experience in that, but it doesn't mean the things don't grow. Am I right? Otherwise, those hillsides back there that are absolutely beautiful, but they look like a jungle at times, those are the plants that you're going to want to seek out to a certain degree and get them established. So, first of all, let's talk about an immediate soil erosion mitigation and slowing down. Now, what I have done and what I would suggest is using and searching out uh, straw wattles that you can get your hands on. And straw wattles are a uh, straw encapsulated in a plastic netting and rolled up into 50 or 100 foot rolls. And this stuff is laid horizontal across the hillside and then staked in place, separated about every three or four feet, depending on the kind of soils you have looser loamy or sandier soils will erode a little faster than heavy clay soils you stake those wattles in place using a 16 inch stake now i understand that what i'm telling you is not the most aesthetically pleasing look but it's that's not the point of it here the point of it is is starting the stabilization of that hillside's process your next step will be the designing the hillside and selecting plant material to use Thick, fibrous root systems are key. This can be ground cover, low shrubbery, small trees. I don't suggest monster trees, but smaller trees like mm, 25 feet or less. Perennials of almost any kind. And I think I mentioned ground cover. Draw it up so the larger plants and trees are spaced out and do not dominate just one area of the hillside. You have something of a symmetrical look to it to a degree. The seasonal colored perennials, ground covers, and everything, those should be located on the bottom third or bottom half of the hill for now. This is mainly for visual appeal as time marches forward. You know, much of the shrubbery, small trees, and larger ground covers will be placed halfway 
up the hillside and towards the top. This does not mean pretties cannot be interspersed on the upper half. It is just not the main focus of the upper half. We want stability. Stability is the key thing. Medium to fast growing plant material is a plus for obvious reasons. And getting it in the ground at the beginning of a growing season or as soon as possible so you have a very long growing season for the hillside to start to get established. You know, you're going to be leaving those wattles in place before, during, and after planting. Once the hillside is mature and established, however long that takes, you can remove the wattles if they are unsightly. They will decompose to some degree during the first two years of installation. And eventually, eventually, through decomposition, only the plastic netting will remain. So you can take that out then too. The decision is really yours. And I'm gonna show you towards the end of this is you're really not gonna see it that much by the time you're all done. But more on that in a few minutes. Now, although my focus here is plant material in this episode, it does not mean you cannot add stabilizing structure to the hillside if you have the capabilities. Not everybody has the capabilities of digging into hillsides and installing big boulders and naturalizing them on a slope of this size. That's why I'm kind of focusing on the greenscape only. There is another part that you have to consider and it's, it's a good one and that is drainage. You know, drainage on a hillside, despite you planting the whole thing, you can really mitigate a lot of erosion uh, and heavy runoff by the installation of drainage. Drainage at the top, especially if you're at the lower part of your neighborhood and your neighbor's yards drain down towards your hillside, if you can hand dig a nice French drain across the top, maybe another one midway and another one at the bottom, connect them all up with just a slight slope to one side of the hillside and then down and then out, you're gonna capture a lot of the damaging water runoff that hillsides are, are subjected to. Just an idea and just another step. You know, planting hills as, uh, as opposed to flat ground or much lesser degree ground is a lesson unto itself. The technique requires a basin construction for every single plant you put in the ground. And that includes ground covers, the small little starters. They need a dug basin. And if you check out the YouTube channel and the short that I have with it, you will see it's not hard. It just takes an extra step or two. That's it. But don't plant it into the angle of the hillside. That is not how we plant hillsides. So what do you do is you dig into the hill above the location where the plant is going to go. Pull the soil down, create yourself a water basin, which is compacted back, leaving yourself a flat, flat area on which to plant your plant material. Whether that be a 15 gallon tree, which is going to require a little work, or a gallon can perennial, or a sprig of ground cover start, whatever it is, you got to do it so that the plant sits flat on that hillside, not on the slope itself. At completion, you will have an installed plant set vertical in the hillside with a flat basin surrounding it. It is important to monitor these basins for a while and repack and reshape them as needed. These basins capture, hold, and allow for water saturation in the root zone without a quick runoff downhill makes for deeper, more fibrous, more intense root systems. And that's what we are shooting for. Very, very important to remember that. So let's take a look at a few selections from the ornamental plant world that have worked for me in projects. And they are applicable to a lot of different USDA zones around the country and around the world. Hey, let's start off with trees, shall we? Remember, I don't suggest monstrous trees, especially for a small neighborhood hillside backyard. Monstrous trees are nice for the first five or 10 years, and then they do become monsters, and they will tend to throw and cast shade shadows on other plants that probably require more sunlight. And then you gotta kinda redo things. I would prefer you to stay 
in the, the realm of small to medium trees, medium trees at biggest. And when I say that, 30 feet or less, and if you can find them 20 feet or less, even better. So here's a couple of selections. In the maple family, the Japanese maple, bohol maples, vine maple, tartarian maple, box elder maple, these are the smaller maple trees. Now granted, they do lose their leaves in the winter time, and that's okay because basically your stabilization will be from the root zones, not necessarily the leaf zones. They do slow it down when rain hits uh, a leaf canopy, but nonetheless, you know, your root systems in a maple is your, is your key element here. Another one is the smaller birches. I was a big fan of the Giacomonte birch, the Himalayan white birch. It, number one, I think it's pretty, and the size is always good for a residential yard. There's also the, the birch nanas, which is kind of a dwarf birch, and then the creative young eye birch, which is kind of a weeping uh, angular type of birch that can be trained into various shapes. Number three is any kind of fruit tree. Fruit trees like cherries, peach, plum, uh, almost any of them, they do have a great root system and they give you something back for the stability. Now, if you take a, a larger hillside and you have a, a section of them where you have a, a cluster of three semi-dwarf cherry trees on this side, semi-dwarf peaches up in this corner, maybe a plum or two in the middle, you see where I'm going? Now you have a very good reason in the early summer, midsummer, and early fall to go get yourself something up there on the, on the hillside. It's really a bonus. You have hillside stability as well as yummy fruit during the growing season. Number four would be evergreens. Evergreens in the smaller categories. Small pines, spruces, cypress work great for these kinds of applications. Fibrous root systems and a way for the, the rain and moisture to be held on the tree and released slowly through the needles. Lastly, columnar juniper varieties and native junipers like the Utah juniper and stuff out in the, the Rocky Mountain West to your area work best, the natives that work best. You can check those out. Now, when we talk about shrubbery, we go back to the juniper again. You see a pattern developing here? Junipers have very fibrous root systems and really hug the ground or at least allow water in the smaller, medium-sized varieties to hang on and release it slowly. Depending on your specific situation, you can select anything from ground-hugging types of junipers, like the blue rug juniper, or small and medium varieties. I don't suggest the monsters. I don't suggest, except for the columnar varieties. When you get into sea green and Fitzers and Andorras, unless you have a monster size hill that you're doing. But junipers are probably at the top of my list, shrubbery wise, to intersperse and mix into your hillside design. Number two, ground cover roses. I love ground cover roses, especially the Drift series. They're much lower, they're spreading, they require very, very little care. They are semi-evergreen in some zones and very deciduous the more north you go. And they tolerate very cold temperatures and snow cover very well. Another favorite of mine, it's a deciduous plant, but Dutzia also works really well because of its root system. The root system is the star here, plus the gorgeous spring color that comes out on those guys. Just great. Number four would be ornamental grasses. The smaller varieties, I suggest, not the monsters. Some of the larger miscanthus and other varieties that get super big, nah, stay away from pompous grass. I don't want to hear anybody planting pompous grass. I just don't think that's a good idea. You could even, maybe you could get away with the dwarf, but I would just stay away from it. I really would. It tends to, the seed heads, although they're pretty, they tend to blow away and start other places. Yeah, nah, nah. Okay, number five, manzanita. Kinnikinnik to some, but get the lower varieties like emerald carpet, anything that is 12 inches or less, and they are fantastic. They really are. Great for higher altitudes, colder temperatures, drier conditions. Do not mix manzanita with something that needs a lot of water. 
It's just not going to work. Manzanita will check out on you within six months. Another one is Gatoniaster. Again, the ground hugging varieties. You get ground cover varieties, and there are some that get up to about 12 to 18 inches. And lastly, another one that I thought about that I've used is Russian Sage. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful lavender blue flowers. You can cut it down to a low shrub in the wintertime, and it comes flying back in the spring. All right, moving on, let's talk about ground covers. Now, I did have a comment on the channel not too long ago <laughs> when somebody told me that vinca or periwinkle is poisonous to dogs. It is slightly toxic, but I have never seen dogs sit there and just nom 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 on it. I really haven't. So if you don't have a dog, you're in the clear. If you do have a dog, keep it away from the vinca. I don't, I've never seen the dog attracted to it anyway, but to be on the safe side. now. I would suggest the Vinca Minor varieties, not the Vinca Major. Vinca Major tends to get a little out of control and can be a little too aggressive for the smaller hillside plantings. I really liked the variegated Vinca Minor, but the green one is nice as well. Great spring and summer color, and it has a very, very run and root habit that'll stabilize a hill very well. You probably didn't think I was gonna talk about it, but I am, and that is Ivy. Now, I'm not talking about Hans Ivy. I'm not talking about Algerian Ivy. I'm talking about Needlepoint. Needlepoint is a smaller, more controllable Ivy, does a good job, and you can keep it in bounds, and it does very, very well. Much more smaller leaf, and very, obviously, by its namesake, very kind of a needle, needle-type leaf. Another one is Pachysandra. Number four is Creeping Phlox. Gorgeous spring color on that. Pachysandra has a summer bloom, and it actually has a nice fragrance to it when in mass. Another one is Carex grasses, which is not to be confused with ornamental grasses. Carex uh, and sedges are a totally different variety than uh, ornamental grass. And lastly, if you happen to have a shady area, look into ferns. Ferns have very, very intense fibrous root systems, and they look great. All right. Number seven is Baccarus, or dwarf coyote bush. Very, very popular mother nature uses out on the west for coastal hillside stability, natural. But you can get the dwarf variety in flats and plant it up. It has kind of a creamy white flower to it that's kind of inconsequential, but it does stay kind of low, like 18 inches or less. Another one that you can disperse in and around shrubbery, lower parts of the hillside, and that is sedums. Sedums are, oh my God, he used Dragon's Blood or Angelina or any of the number of sedums that are out there. They look delicate, but they're really not that delicate. They may not want to be walked on a lot, but they sure do have a heck of a root system, a beautiful clean look to them, and a lot of color. Or if you went away from the ground cover parts of sedums, you could get into Autumn Joy and some more upright ones that really look nice and give you color during the early fall months. Number nine, ice plant. I would suggest the Drosanthemum variety or the Mesembrianthum varieties. Uh, not the freeway type of ice plant, the Epibrotus types, nah, stay away from that. And lastly, creeping rosemary. You get to use it in cooking. It's a fast one. It does not like a lot of water and it, uh, it is a heck of a bee attractor. So keep that in mind when it blooms. If you have some type of allergen to walking out there with bees. If it's honeybees, just don't bother them. They're not gonna bother you. Okay, moving on to perennials. To keep this thing fairly short, I'm gonna throw at it this way. Any perennial you wanna put in there that stays under two feet tall, go for it. Do it in masses, do it in clusters and clumps, and you will really have just that much more added bonus of color and stabilization at the same time. Now, remember when you're doing perennials, Remember the mature size and remember spacing in all of your design of this hillside. That way you're not having to go back in a few years and start taking things out because you overplanted. And if you happen to go pro, you happen to go pro and hire somebody, make sure they don't overplant the hillside and then leave it for you to clean up five years later. All right, so you've made your selections. Maybe you've gone as far as to go out there and plant it up. Maybe you've irrigated as well. Now your final stage of stabilization is going to be mulching. And mulching fairly heavy. Where you have some ground cover plantings, 
You can thin it down a bit so you have a run and root type of situation that isn't impeded. But around the plants, the trees, the bottom of the hillsides, wherever you can find it, mulch it in. Mulch it in four to six inches thick. This will slow down water penetration. It will keep water in and around the root zones and keep the root zones cool and productive and growing much faster than if you just do it and leave it bare. Now, I do not suggest stone material as a mulch on a steep hillside. I, I think we can all understand why. But if you want to get fancy, you can get uh, small, small boulders in the 9, 12, 14 inch, and you can reinforce those basins on the uphill side of your planting area or the lower side of your planting area or both. It really adds a nice touch and it really holds the basin together for much longer. So if you want to do something like that, hey, knock yourself out. You know, for the first year, inspection and adjustment is very important when you have a hillside planting. Maintaining those basins, directing spreading plants in the right direction, and eventually customizing and adding as desired. As things get bigger, you see opportunities for other things. Once the hillside is stabilized, you can kind of start adding things. You can get bulbs started in there. You can do uh, trellised things along the fence lines. You can do all kinds of stuff. You know, I really do hope this helps a bit and offers some insight as to the approach and challenge to this part of landscaping. Hillsides can be a beautiful freaking tapestry on which to display your work. It's tilted right there in your face at an angle which is just different than a flat yard. Or, or it can be a losing battle and a struggle if not approached in the right way. So, do it right the first time. It may take a little more effort, I'm not going to say it's not, but well worth it as the plants and everything start to mature and fill in. Hey, don't forget to give yourself access to the hillside as well, with steps and pathways for ease of maintenance, tool access, and more importantly, your enjoyment of walking through the landscape you created. Your finished hillside should last for many, many years and can allow you to sleep at night should the heavens open up. Hey, that's what I have for you guys this week. Hope you check out the YouTube channel. I really do, because there'll be a lot more visual there. If you need a little help, I'm only an email away yardcoach at gmail.com. Please take a few minutes and go over to the website for the products that I have available, youryardcoach.com, and the Amazon link is always, always there. Hey guys, as always to your landscape success, I will see you next week and bye for now. Hey friends, Maestro here, just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. Again, thanks for listening to this week's show, and we'll see you right here next week.